Hey, what is up, YouTube? It's Malorn here, and I'm here with another great video for you guys today. Today, I've got another Magnus Chase, the Sword of Summer audiobook. So, we've got. Man, get to the chapter. We've got chapter 7, 8, and 9 today for you guys. So, let's go ahead and get. Chapter 7. You look great without a nose. Really. Well, Magnus, you're probably thinking that was stupid. Thanks, I have my moments. Normally I don't go stepping in the walls of flame, but I had a feeling it wouldn't hurt me. I know that sounds weird, but so far I hadn't passed out. The heat didn't feel so bad, even though the pavement was turning to sludge at my feet. Extreme temperatures have never bothered me. I don't know why. Some people are double-jointed. Some people can wiggle their ears. I can sleep outside in the winter without freezing to death, or hold matches under my hand without getting burned. I'd won some bets that way in the homeless shelters, but I never thought of my tolerance as something special magical. I definitely never tested its limits. I walk through the curtain of fire and smack Sirt in the head with my rusty sword. Because, you know, I always try to keep my promises. The blade didn't seem to hurt him, but the swirling flames died. Sirt stared at me for a millisecond, completely shocked. Then he punched me in the gut. I'd been punched before, just not by a fiery heavyweight whose ring name was the Black One. <laughs> I folded like a deck chair. My vision blurred and tripled. When I regained my focus, I was on my knees, staring at a puddle of regurgitated milk, turkey, and crackers steaming on the asphalt. Sirt couldn't have, could have taken my head off with his fiery sword, but I guess he didn't feel like I was worth it. He paced in front of me, making sounds. Feeble, he said. A soft little boy. Give me the blade of your own free will, Veneer Spawn. I promise you a quick death. Veneer Spawn? I knew a lot of good insults, but I'd never heard that one. The corroded sword was still in my hand. I felt my pulse against the metal as if the sword itself had developed a heartbeat. Resonating up the blade all the way to my ears was a faint hum like a car engine turning over. You can renew it, Randolph had told me. I could almost, I could almost believe the old weapon was stirring, waking up. Not fast enough, though. Sirk kicked me in the ribs and sent me sprawling. I lay flat on my back, staring at the smoke in the winter sky. Sirk must have kicked me hard enough to trigger a near-death hallucination. A hundred feet up, I saw a girl in armor on a horse made of mist, circling like a vulture over the battle. She held a spear made of pure light. Her chainmail shone like silver glass. She wore a conical steel helmet over a green head, green head wrap, some sort of like a medieval knight. Her face was beautiful but stern. Our eyes met for a fraction of a second. If you are real, I thought, help. She dissolved into smoke. The sword, Sirt demanded. His obsidian face looming over me. It's worth more to me freely surrendered, but if I must, I will pry it from your dead fingers. In the distance, sirens wailed. I wondered why emergency crews hadn't shown up already. Then I remembered the other two giant explosions in Boston. Had Sirt caused them too, or brought along some fiery friends? At the edge of the bridge, Hearth staggered to his feet. A few unconscious pedestrians had started to stir. I couldn't see Randolph and Blitz anywhere. Hopefully they were out of danger by now. If I could keep Burning Man occupied, maybe the rest of the bystander, bystanders would have time to clear out too. Somehow, I managed to stand. I looked at the sword and, yeah, I was definitely hallucinating. Instead of a corroded piece of junk, I held an actual weapon. The leather-wrapped grip felt warm and comfortable in my hand. The pommel, a simple polished steel oval, helped counterweight the 30-inch blade, which was double-edged and rounded at the tip, more for hacking than for stabbing. Down the center of the blade, a wide groove was emblazoned with viking runes, the same kind I'd seen in Randolph's office. They shimmered in a lighter shade of silver, as if they'd been inlaid with the blade was for while the blade was forged. The sword was definitely humming now, almost like a human voice trying to find the right pitch. Sirt stepped back. His lava-red eyes flick flickered nervously. You don't know what you have there, boy. You won't live long enough to find out. He swung his scimitar. I'd had no experience with swords, unless you count watching the Princess Bride 26 times as a kid. Sirt would have cut me in half, but my weapon had other ideas. Ever held, ever held a spinning top on top of your finger? You can feel it moving under its own power, tilting in all directions. The sword was like that. It swung itself, blocking Sirt's fiery blade. Then it spun in an arc, dragging my arm along with it, and hacked into Sirt's right leg. The black one screamed. The wound in his thigh smoldered, setting his pants on fire. His blood sizzled and glowed like the flow from a volcano. His fiery blade dissipated. Before he could recover, my sword leaped upward and slashed his face. With a howl, Sirt stumbled back, cupping his hands over his nose. 
To my left, someone screamed, the mother with the two kids. Harth was trying to help her extract her toddlers from the stroller, which was now smoking and about to combust. Harth, I yelled before, remem before remembering that was no good. With Cert still distracted, I limped over to Harth and pointed down the bridge. Go, get the kids out of here. He could re lift just fine, but he didn't like my message. He shook his head adamantly, hoisting one of the toddlers into his arms. The mom was cradling the other kid. Leave now, I told her. My friend will help you. The mom didn't hesitate. Harth gave me one last look. This is not a good idea. Then he followed her, the little kid, bouncing up and down in his arms, crying. Ah. Other innocent people were still stuck on the bridge. Drivers trapped in their cars, pedestrians wandering about in a daze. Their clothes steaming and their skin lobster red. Emergency sirens were closer now, but I didn't see how the police or paramedics could help if Set was still storming around, being all fiery and stuff. Boy! The black one sounded like he was gargling with syrup. He took his hands from his face, and I saw why. My self-guided sword had taken off his nose. Molten blood streamed down his cheeks, splattering on the pavement in sizzling droplets. His pants had burned off, leaving him a pair of flame-patterned red boxers. Between that and the newly sawed-off snout, he looked like a diabolical version of Porky Pig. I have tolerated you long enough, he gargled. I was just thinking the same thing about you. I raised the sword. Do you want this? Come and get it. In retrospect, that was a pretty stupid thing to say. Above me, I caught a glimpse of the weird gray apparition, a girl on a horse circling like a vulture watching. Instead of charging, Cert bent down and scooped asphalt from the road with his bare hands. He molded it into a red-hot spear of steaming gunk and pitched it toward me like a fastball. Another game I'm not good at, baseball. I swung the sword, hoping to knock away the projectile. I missed. The asphalt cannonball... The asphalt cannonball plowed into my gut and embedded, embedded itself, burning, searing, and destroying. I couldn't breathe. The pain was so intense, I felt every cell in my body explode in a chain reaction. Despite that, a strange sort of calm fell over me. I was dying. I wasn't coming back from this. Part of me thought, All right, make it count. My vision dimmed. The sword hummed and tugged at my hand, but I could barely feel, his, feel my arms. Sturt studied me, a smile on his ruined face. He wants the sword, I told myself. He can't have it. If I'm going out, he's going with me. Weakly, I raised my free hand. I flipped him a gesture that he wouldn't need to know sign language to understand. He roared and charged. Just as he reached me, my sword leaped and ran him through. I used the last of my strength to grapple him as his momentum carried us both over the railing. No! He fought to free himself, bursting into flames, kicking and gouging, but I held him... But I held on as we plummeted toward the Charles River, my sword still embedded in the stomach. My own organs burning away from the molten tar in my gut. The sky flashed in and out of view. I caught a glimpse of the smoky apparition. The girl on the horse diving toward me in a full gallop, her hand outstretched. Floom! I hit the water. Then I died. The end. Chapter 8 Mind the Gap and also the hairy guy with the axe. Back in school, I loved ending stories that way. It's a perfect conclusion, isn't it? Billy went to school, he had a good day, then he died. The end. It doesn't leave you hanging, it wraps everything up nice and neat. Except in my case, it didn't. Maybe you're thinking, oh, Magnus, you didn't really die, otherwise you couldn't be narrating this story, you just came close. Then you were miraculously rescued, blah blah blah. Nope, I actually died, 100%. Guts impaled, vital organs burned, head smacked into a frozen river from 40 feet up. Every bone in my body broken, lungs filled with ice water. The medical term for that is dead. Gee, Magnus, what did it feel like? It hurt a lot. Thanks for asking. I started to dream, which was weird. Not only because I was dead, but because I never dreamed. People have tried to ar have tried to argue with me about that. They say everybody dreams, and I just don't remember mine. But I'm telling you, I always slept like the dead. Unless I was until I was dead, then I dreamed like a normal person. I was hiking with my mom in the Blue Hills. I was maybe 10 years old. It was a warm summer day with a cool breeze through the pines. We stopped at Houston, at Houghton's Pond to skip stones across the, across the water. I managed three skips. My mom managed four. She always won. Neither of us cared. She would laugh and hug me, and that was enough for me. It's hard to describe her. To really understand Natalie Chase, you had to meet her. She used to joke that her spirit animal was Tinkerbell from Peter Pan. You can imagine Tinkerbell at age 30-something, minus the wings, wearing flannel, denim, and Doc Martens. You've got a pretty good picture of my mom. She was a petite lady with delicate features, short blonde pixie hair, and leaf green eyes that sparkled with humor. Whenever she read me stories, I used to gaze at the spray of freckles across her nose and try to count them. 
She radiated joy. It's the only way I can put it. She loved life. Her, enthu her enthusiasm was infectious. She was the kindest, most easygoing person I ever knew. Until the weeks leading up to her death. In the dream, that was still the years in the future. We stood together at the pond. She took a deep breath, inhaling the scent of warm pine needles. This is where I met your father, she told me. On a summer day, just like this. The comment surprised me. She really talked about my dad. I'd never met him, never seen, never even seen pictures of him. That might sound strange, but my mom didn't make a big deal out of their relationship, so neither did I. She was clear that my dad hadn't abandoned us. He just moved on. She wasn't bitter. She had fond memories of their brief time together. After it ended, she found out she was pregnant with me, and she was elated. Ever since, it had been just the two of us. We didn't need anyone else. You met him at the pond, I asked? Was he good at skipping stones? She laughed. Oh yeah, he destroyed me at, skip at stone skipping. That first day, it was perfect. Well, except for one thing. She pulled me close and kissed my forehead. I didn't have you yet, pumpkin. Okay, yes, my mom called me pumpkin. Go ahead and laugh. As I got older, it embarrassed me, but that was while she was still alive. Now I'd give anything to hear her call me pumpkin again. What was my dad like, I asked. It felt strange to say my dad. How can somebody be yours if you've never met him? What happened to him? My mom spread her arms to the sunlight. That's why I bring you here, Magnus. Can't you feel it? He's all around us. I didn't know what she meant. Usually, she didn't talk in metaphors. My mom was about as literal and down to earth as you could get. She ruffled my hair. Come on, I'll race you to the beach. My dream shifted. I found myself standing in Uncle Randolph's library. In front of me, lounging sideways across the desk, was a man I'd never seen before. He was walking with he was wa he was walking his fingers across a collection of old maps. Death was an interesting choice, Magnus. The man grinned. His clothes looked fresh from the store. Blinding white sneakers, crisp new jeans, and a Red Sox home jersey. His feathery hair was a mix of red, brown, and yellow, tussled in a fashionable, I just got out of bed and I looked this good sort of way. His face was shockingly handsome. He could have done ads for aftershave and men's magazines, but his scars ruined the perfection. Burn tissue splashed across the bridge of his nose and his cheekbones like impact lines on the moon's surface. His lips were marred by a row of welts all the way around his mouth, maybe piercing holes that had closed over. But why would anyone have that many mouth piercings? <coughs> I wasn't sure what to say to the scarred hallucination, but since my mom's words were still lingering in my head, I asked, Are you my father? The hallucination raised his eyebrows. He threw back his head and laughed. Oh, I like you. We'll have fun. No, Magnus Chase, I'm not your father, but I'm definitely on your side. He traced his finger in the, under the Red Sox logo on his jersey. You'll meet my son soon enough. Until then, a little advice. Don't trust appearances. Don't trust your comrade's motives. Oh, and... He lunged forward and grabbed my wrist. Tell the All-Father I said hello. Tried to break free. His grip was like steel. The dream changed. Suddenly I was flying through cold gray fog. Stop struggling, said a female voice. Holding my wrist was the girl I'd seen circling the bridge. She charged through the air on her nebulous horse, pulling me along at her side like I was a sack of laundry. Her blazing spear was strapped across her back. Her chainmail armor glinted in the gray light. She tightened her grip. Do you want to fall into the gap? I got a feeling she wasn't talking about the clothing store. Looking below me, I saw nothing. Just endless gray. I decided I did not want to fall into it. I tried to speak, but I couldn't. I shook my head weakly. Then stop struggling, she, stop struggling, she ordered. Beneath her helmet, a few wisps of dark hair had escaped her green headscarf. Her eyes were the color of wood, redwood bark. Don't make me regret this, she said. My consciousness faded. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. I awoke gasping, every muscle in my body tingling with alarm. I sat up and grabbed my gut, expecting to find a burning hole where my intestines used to be. No smoldering asphalt was embedded, was embedded there. I felt no pain. The strange sword was gone. My clothes looked perfectly fine, not wet or burned or torn. In fact, my clothes looked too fine. The same stuff I'd been wearing for weeks. My only pair of jeans, my layer of shirts, my jacket. They didn't smell. They'd seemingly been washed dry, been washed, dried, and put back on me while I was unconscious, which was an unsettling idea. They even had a warm lemony scent that reminded me of the good old days when my mom did my laundry. My shoes were like new, as shiny as when I dug them out of the dumpster behind Marathon Sports. Even weirder, I was clean. 
My hands weren't caked with grime. My skin felt freshly scrubbed. I ran my fingers through my hair and found no tangles, no twigs, no pieces of litter. Slowly, I got to my feet. There wasn't a scratch on me. I bounced on my heels. I felt like I could run a mile. I breathed in the smell of chimney fires and an approaching snowstorm. I almost laughed with relief. Somehow, I'd survived. Except, that wasn't possible. Where was I? Gradually, my senses expanded. I was standing in the entry courtyard of an opulent townhouse, the kind you might see on Beacon Hill. On Beacon Hill. Eight stories of imposing white limestone and gray marble jutting into the winter sky. The double front doors were dark, heavy wood bound, were dark, heavy wood bound with iron. In the center of each was a life-sized wolf's head knock door knocker. Wolves. That alone was enough to make me hate the place. I turned to look for a street exit. There wasn't one, just a 15 foot tall white limestone wall surrounding the courtyard. How could you not have a front gate? I couldn't see much over the wall, but I was obviously still in Boston. I recognized some of the b surrounding buildings. In the distance rose the towers of downtown crossing. I was probably on Beacon Street, just across from the common, but how had I gotten here? In one corner of the courtyard stood a tall birch tree with pure white bark. I thought about climbing it to get over the wall, but the lowest branches were out of reach. Then I realized the tree was in full leaf, which shouldn't have been possible in the winter. Not only that, its leaves glittered gold as if someone had painted them with 24 carat gilt. Next to the tree, a bronze plate was affixed to the wall. I hadn't really noticed it earlier, since half the buildings in Boston had historic markers, but... Now I looked closer. The inscriptions were in two languages. One was the Norse alphabet I'd seen earlier. The other was English. Welcome to the Grove of Glacier. No soliciting, no loitering. Hotel deliveries, please use the Nifelheim entrance. Okay, I'd exceeded my daily quota of bazaar. I had to get out of here. I had to get over that wall, find out what had happened to Blitz and Hearth, and maybe Uncle Randolph if I was feeling generous, then possibly hitchhike to Guatemala. I was done with this town. Then the, then the double doors swung inward with a groan. Blinding gold light, golden light spilled out. A burly man appeared on the stoop. He wore a doorman's uniform, top hat, white gloves, and a dark green jacket with tails and the interlocking letters HV embroider, embroidered on his lapel. But there was no way this guy was an actual doorman. His warty face was smeared with ashes. His beard hadn't been trimmed in decades. His eyes were bloodshot and murderous. And a double-bladed axe hung at his side. His name tag read, Hunding, Saxony, Valley team member since 749 CE. S -s Sorry, I stammered. I must, um, wrong house? The man scowled. He shuffled closer and sniffed at me. He smelled like turpentine and burning meat. Wrong house? I don't think so. You're checking in. Uh, what? You're dead, aren't you? The man said. Follow me. I'll show you the registration. Alright guys, that's chapter 7 and 8 of The Sword of Summer from the Magnus Chase series by Rick Riordan. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Make sure to drop a like, comment, and subscribe to my channel if you did. And I'll see you guys next time on my next video, which will probably be tomorrow. Um, yeah. Sorry about the allergies today. I've had them like all day long. It's really irritating. I don't know what's going on, but like my nose tickles and stuff. It's just oh, it's so weird. I, I don't like it when my nose tickles because I just sit there and it just bugs the crap out of me. Oh. Okay. Whew. Peace out.